Welcome to Conversations with the USA Racewalking Foundation. Okay, welcome to our second of talks with uh, America's elite racewalkers. Today we have Miranda Melville. She's an Olympian. Uh, she also is a 20-time international competitor and has won a national title 17 times. So welcome, Miranda. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's our pleasure. So I'm going to start off with the easiest question. How did you get started with racewalking? Yeah, the most common question, right? Uh, I feel bad whenever I say it because it sounds really rehearsed now, but uh, <laughs> I definitely started in high school. Uh, it's a normal event for girls track and field um, in New York State. So I grew up in New York State, like way Western upstate New York, kind of towards Canada. Um, and so it's just a 1500 meter in high school. So I started there and then I progressed and did it in college throughout college and then became an elite athlete after college. So let's talk a little bit about like your New York high school experience, because I think that's very different from what everybody growing up in the country is like. Um, I grew up in New York when it was still a boys event, but it, it's no longer a scoring boys event in New York. Um, tell us what it was like. Did you have other race walkers on your team or were you like the sole race walker? I did have other race walkers on my team. In fact, one of my high school teammates did try to come out to the elite level. She competed in the 2012 Olympic trials, Rachel Zoyhovsky. Um, she and I trained a lot together. I definitely had other teammates um, when I was in high school that were trying to race walk or learning how to race walk and liked it. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a big it was like a big event, you know, and it was a tough event, right? Like to make it to state was really difficult. Um, you definitely had to be like a sub 720 uh, on, for the 1500 meter. And then like, even with, with that, right, you were going to get smoked if you went to state because um, you had people who could walk under seven minute if you went to state. So it was definitely a very competitive event. Um, I didn't, you know, for me personally, I think I like lived a very aloof experience because I was not aware of the junior scene. I wasn't very aware of anything really outside my bubble. I kind of was very like that typical high school person who just lives in like their, their, their moment, you know, um, and that's very common. And so it wasn't, you know, until people started telling me about opportunities as a junior, unfortunately, I didn't really start hearing about those opportunities till I was a senior in high school. But yeah, so I didn't really know about many of the like other junior experiences. Like I didn't know about the U20s. I didn't know about anything like that until I was basically about to go to college. Um, and at that point, I only had one year left of eligibility to be a junior. Um, so I just did my best to maximize it that year and and be the best I could. So I ended up going from walking a 1500 in high school to right into a 10K my first year of college. So it was a pretty big jump. And then after that, my second year of college, I doubled it and went into the 20K because I had no choice. I was a, at a senior level of an event. So my progression from in distance was pretty quick. That, that certainly was. Hold on, I'm gonna pause. So Miranda, that kind of brings me to uh, the next question, which was, so, and I remember as a junior doing exactly what you did. I found out about a week before the junior nationals that there was a thing called the junior nationals. And I led for a mile and finished second to last because I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. So you went from this high school bubble of sorts to mm -hmm. a race walking powerhouse in University of Wisconsin at Parkside. And you had not just like a teammate who was race walking, but I believe many. So can you talk about like what that was like and how it differed suddenly training with a coach that specialized in race walking, having, you know, significant elite race walkers above you. And as you progress through the ranks, you know, maybe a mentorship with people beneath you and, and all that kind of thing. Yeah, like, you know, I uh, I was definitely taking my time to adjust. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I definitely had little injuries that came up, but like going to Parkside, you know, it was because of Dave McGovern that I knew about Parkside. I went to a clinic um, my the summer before my senior year with Dave McGovern, and he told me about University of Wisconsin Parkside and um, coach Mike DeWitt at the time. And he said it was worth me looking into and I went and visited and I liked it and he offered me a scholarship. And then we realized that the other rest of my like tuition could kind of be paid from my good grades. So an academic scholarship. So I had two scholarships to kind of cover most of my undergrad, which was really nice. Um, and so like being there my first year, like it, you know, I'm a thousand miles away from home. I'm 
it's similar, but it's not right. Like upstate New York, rolling Hills, like same type of seasons, pretty similar weather. Like that stuff's all similar, but it's, it's not home, right? You have to adjust to obviously having a roommate and having a doormate. And like, obviously there's a lot of just little things that in your life that are changing and you're managing your own schedule and grades and um, that with coupled with trying to be, you know, a collegiate athlete, right? Like it's just normal things that, you know, you'd have to adjust to. And so there were little hiccups along the way and, and, and things like that. But um, I remember DeWitt telling me at the time that there was a U.S. juniors um, team coming up that it was to go to Russia. And so I just put a sign on my desk in my room and just said like, you know, and I just made it, I colored and made it all pretty. And I just wrote Russia, right? Like I just wrote Russia and I was like, I want to try and make Russia. And so, um, that was like my goal all year was like, I wanted to be top three in the 10 K, which I don't know where I thought I was just going to be top three in the 10 K from like, I've never done a 10, 10 K. I was just this, like, I'm going to be top three in the U S I don't know. I just made this great, this huge goal. had no clue what I was really doing. Fast forward. I do end up qualifying. Um, uh, luckily got my first U S junior trip to trip to go all the way over there. I finished third at the trials. I finished first American in Russia. And then I won U S juniors that nationals that year. And then I won U S versus Canada that year as well. So I had a very, for a very short junior year that I had, it was semi successful, right? There was no amazing time that I walked. Like I didn't do any like sub 50 minutes or anything like that. I was not some like, you know, prodigy coming up. Um, I just happened to be the fastest girl that year. That's all it was. Um, and you know, I, again, I still was living in a bit of a bubble because I don't think I realized how fast the juniors were before me. I didn't realize how fast, like, um, uh, Maria was before me or a Lauren Forges or anybody like that. I just, knew I did well that year and then going, and then now I had to make another jump into the 20 K. So, um, also the year I went, it was 2008, which was a big Olympic year. So being at Parkside, a lot of the people that were around me training were training for Olympic trials. So I like, even though I was there with them training, I was in a very different mindset than them. Like it was, a they were very hyper-focused and like, it was stressful. <laughs> and I was just like, la, 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 la. I'm a freshman in college. I'm just a junior moving up to the 10K, la, 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 la. Like it was very, very different. <laughs> sure. So first of all, I think you sell yourself a little short. Um, the way I look at junior nationals, it's not about time. It's about place. And as a young athlete, keeping your head together to win a race or place for an international team is what it's about. It's not about setting records. You know, records often come in either the international competition itself or a more local race where there's no stress and, you know, you're comfortable yeah. and things like that. Or you have somebody way faster than you pacing you. There's there's all sorts of things, but rarely is the junior national record set at the junior nationals. Um, I know. Just yeah. It is, is that hard. Um, one last question about college, because I think a lot of younger athletes will um, gain value from this, which is. Did you run at all while you were at Parkside or were you solely race walking? No, yeah, I was running cross country. Um, I was definitely running cross country. That was kind of like the deal. It was, it was an interesting deal, right? Like I had to run cross country and then for track, because the way it works for NCAA is that like you need so many athletes competing for like at like so many meets per year. So like you need like 16 girls compete. I'm not really sure if this is the number, I'm just making an arbitrary number. Um, 16 girls have to compete in four meets from your team if you want to send anybody to nationals. So I was kind of like for track season, I was more focused on race walking all spring um, through indoor and outdoor track. But I went to a lot of track meets because, you know, even if I ran a three minute 800 meter, it was enough of my body participating so that my teammates could go to nationals and compete at, you know, wherever NCAA uh, division two was competing that year. So that was kind of like my responsibility. So like, I'm pretty sure if you look up, <laughs> if you look up online, it says like, I threw the javelin like four meters. And that's true. <laughs> I literally walked up to the line and chucked it down and then went and did my race walk workout somewhere in the area. Like it's, it's like, th there's stats out there that if you look at them, like that's so embarrassing, but I was like, 
well, it wasn't really an effort. It was just, <laughs> it was to make sure my other be, teammates succeeded. <laughs> being a team player. Um, yeah. So, so if you and Katie Burnett had a dual meet of race walking and javelin throwing, um, it would oh, not yeah, come Katie, out in your favor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would not. <laughs> um, so you had mentioned um, one of your fellow competitors uh, and teammate, and clearly someone who came before you was Maria McDecoffey. Mm -hmm. um, your career has been intertwined with her, shall we say, right? From the time you kind of came up onto the the national international scene. How how would you say that friendship and obviously a level of rivalry um, affected your career, both, you know, positive and or negative? I think like Maria and I, like she's always been really positive to me. Like, so obviously for those who don't know and those who do know, just a reminder, Maria beat me in 2012 to make the Olympic team in London by 2.2 seconds. She outkicked me in the last like 150 meters. Um, and, you know, we, we went through, uh, we had, cause I was then the Olympic alternates. We had to go through team, some of team processing together. And, you know, I just was like in there trying to be really excited for her, like really like amping her up being like, this is so great. You're going to do awesome. And she wrote me like the nicest letter from the Olympics. And I still have it to this day. Like she typed up this really nice letter, just being like, you know, I remember like when you weren't sure if you could do this and you weren't, you know, and, you, know you had like the best race at Olympic trials and she was just so positive. And so like, yeah, we have been rivals and there's been time where we were well, probably more me than anything because I'm younger than her, a little immature about our rivalry at times. Um, but for the most part, like we've always been able to discuss like, what's going on and support each other and hug each other at the end of something. And, you know, and it, we've become very close over this last over a decade now, like we're very close. Um, we spent, we, we stay with each other. We always, we've gone out to dinner almost after every national championship together. Um, we're very close. Uh, and, you know, I think that's really important in women's sports. I think it's really easy to pin other women against women. And um, I think it's really easy, especially because we're coming off a time where women's sports, when they first came out, you know, when title nine started happening, there were only so many spots, you know, to get a scholarship and women really were fighting each other to get those spots and to like make that. And right. And so it, rivalries became more than what they needed to be because women just were like, not used to that. And now we're, we're really coming out of it nicely where women want to lift each other up more. Um, women want to help each other out more. And I think it's a beautiful thing. And it's something that when I'm like with a junior athlete or when I'm with other competitors or I'm talking to a high school team, it's like, I want to be encouraging of that being like, you guys are all going to do great. And, and like, you see it too. Like they're all so happy for each other. They're all like really positive for one another. And it goes outside of just maybe their team. It's to other schools and other teams and other friends. And it's it's such a beautiful thing to see happening in women's sports because it wasn't like that always. And it's it's a really nice development to have happening. That's a great perspective. And you know, as a white old male, I like I never really thought about mm -hmm. the increased rivalry because of a reduced number of scholarships. Right. So that that's a great perspective. All right. Um, you sort of mentioned, but people listening probably don't know that you had an epic battle with Maria in 2016. And when I was 2012, 2012. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Correct my notes there. 2012. I mushed it all together over the years. That's right, because 2016 was real. Um, in in 2012, um, when I was putting your profile together, I sort of forgot that you weren't walking with Maria at the beginning of the race. Right? You were. You were further back and, you know, other people at different times were in contention. So take us through, you know, because that that had to be not the crowning achievement, but one of the most intense races of your life. Um, take us through how you went from not being with the leaders to having the confidence to walk up to the leaders and having an epic showdown to where you're you're being coached by the same uh, coach as Maria and, and he's yelling at you guys with a lap to go. Yeah. So again, I take like, when I look at some of those earlier years of walking 20 K, a lot of things I did were just out of being completely naive and just like, you know, you can't overthink it. Right. Cause you don't have the experience to overthink it. Um, so 2012, um, Tim Seaman was my coach at the time and he had trained us that like, we were going to go out at 136 pace and 
you know, I think it was like, you know, Maria was planning to go out something faster, but I, you know, he had something within our realm, like each person's realm of what he felt they, not a ceiling, but what was safe to go out in. And then they can work from there and see how the race goes and race as needed. Right. Um, so I did that. I went out in my like 448 pace and I felt really good. And I just like kind of pick, I didn't really pick it up a ton. Right. Cause I walked like four, 134. 57. So really I only picked it up like maybe two seconds per K. It wasn't like crazy, but I just was very consistent. And the girls in front of me went out at what was the A standard pace at the time of 133.30 and they were falling back. So they were probably a solid 300, 350 meters almost in front of me. Like they probably were going to get close to lapping me, but they started falling back and I picked it up very lightly and was just kind of hunting them until I caught them. And then it was a very like, I don't know what to do now that I caught them. <laughs> I've never been in this position. Um, kind of like the cat that catches the mouse and doesn't know what to do with it. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, like we had spent so much time visualizing that I was just going to race this pace that we didn't talk about what to do when I actually caught the lead pack. So, um, you know, and I never really, I guess, took the time to envision it either myself. And I, you know, again, being a naive athlete. Um, and so I got there and I kind of like had more momentum than they did, but I kind of tucked in with them because I didn't know how much fight they could have because I'm still learning how to race them. And it became like slowly, like kind of battling them back and forth and people kind of falling off. And then, um, it's Maria and I with a few laps. Oh, and, you know, it was getting really intense <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't know you know, like you don't know what's going to happen. And with like 200 meters to go, Tim was down by the 200 meter. He screamed to us, you have to decide it now. Don't kick and get food. And so we're coming off the turn and Maria kind of like 150 meters starts to make a move. I try to respond. And then she just has this extra gear that I did not have. And she just brought it in and, and made the 2012 team by just, again, about 2.2 seconds, 2.3 seconds, she beat me by. So it was a really good day. He yard by like close to two and a half, three minutes that day, which was awesome. Um, and then Maria obviously went on to set a huge PR and walk one hour and 32 minutes and some change at the Olympics. So we both had outstanding years in the end. Um, but you know, at the time only one of us could go. And so it was like a very like kind of like surreal moment. Yeah. So usually you say any PR is a good PR and certainly it was a great performance, but you know, then, then when the adrenaline leaves, right. It, the, the reality yeah. sets that you're so close. Um, it's probably a great lesson for everybody on how you handle that. Right. How, what, what'd you do to come back and, you know, set your target for 2016? You know, I wasn't that upset about that race. Like I was just like, oh, wow, so close. Like I, my whole idea was that I was only going to move out to California for a year and train. And then maybe I was going to get a job or go to grad school or something like that was not my intention to be out there, but I was just so close that I was like, oh, well, I might as well keep training like four years. That's not that long. I won't, you know, I'm not going to be, I'm still young enough that I could do it. Um, so it was like, kind of like, okay. And like, obviously I had the support of not only like friends, but my parents who were like really willing to, <laughs> to help foot a little bit of that bill at first. Uh, <laughs> um, so that was a really big, helpful, you know, that was a big contingent component component of that. Um, but it became very much like, you know, that one, that, it, I don't think Olympic trials was the disappointing year. It, it came in 2013 worlds when I was at my championship that was more of a I failed because I got DQ'd and I'd never really been DQ'd before and I got DQ'd at the world championship my first big world championship and I was DQ'd 12k in Tim was there he told me like I looked fine you know I, I couldn't tell you what was necessarily wrong that day but I clearly didn't look good and um that one was the one where I came home from Moscow and was just kind of like, yeah, I need a few weeks, no race walk talk. Like I need to just think this through and realize like, was this a fluke thing? Do I want to work through this? What is this? What is this barrier? What does this mean? And so after like, you know, taking some time off, like a few weeks off from training, it became time to start training again for the fall and getting in that base season. 
And it was like, yeah, okay, like I'm going to do this, but I have some things I have to fix. Like I have to really work on my technique clearly. So I spent all fall and probably all of almost indoors really focusing on my technique that year. And it, I went to altitude that, uh, that 2014 for a month. Um, I went to Albuquerque and prepared for a month and just kept doing my drills and stuff. And it was great because when I came out of Albuquerque, we had our cup trials for, um, we went to Taisang that year in China and, um, I walked a, a huge PR, I walked 133.10 and I was super thrilled. And I was like, yes, yes, this is why you stay with it. This is why you keep going. Like it sucks when you're in those valleys. It really, really sucks. Like there's no there's no other way to put it, you know, it's awful. It's like, a, you know, but when you climb out and you get to look at the view from when you climbed out, it's amazing. So it's just, it becomes up to the person, right? Like a lot of people can walk away from sport and it's, it's fine, right? You're going to go on and do other things that make you happy. Um, but if this is what makes you happy, then stick to it. Just know that there are those peaks and valleys and you've got to, you've got to be willing to climb out of the valley a little bit. And it's not going to be a great straight trajectory up. It's going to be a little a little hilly. Absolutely. Yeah. There's no straight line to the Olympics is what I, I've always no. said. Um, so let's talk about the peak. So you came back in 2016, you had the time standard, which basically meant that if you were the top three at the trials, right, you will go to the Olympics. Um, so how did you approach that race? And, and then actually, how did you feel going into Rio and, and the actual games? Olympic trials like leading in Maria and I were like because we were in Rome together before that and I we were basically like talking to each other and it's not like we were like we're like as long as neither of us get appendicitis we're going like <laughs> like <laughs> we cannot get sick don't step off a curb wrong don't do anything that's gonna jeopardize like I like remember a few people went to like the the like before Olympic trials they're like oh we're going to the ocean you want to come and I was like no no, I don't. I don't want to step on anything. Nope, 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 nope. Like, I was like, I'm not willing to risk anything. Um, and, you know, obviously I was being more overcautious than anything. Um, I just felt very secure that I could get top three that day. Like, you know, it didn't have to be first. It didn't have to be second. I just had to be third. And I felt very secure that I could pull that off that day, um, given how the last four years had went and my own just kind of like tenacious racing. Um, I was like, I felt very comfortable and confident with where I was at. Um, and it was a great moment, right? Like with, I think I had a lap to go or two laps to go. My dad typically does my aid. And so I think with two laps to go, I told him, I think I told him like two effing laps to go drop my bottle and go to the finish line. I'll see you there. Like, I don't <laughs> care. Like, I don't want aid get out of here. Like, I'll see you guys there. Like I was very like super excited. Like in the middle of the race, I'm telling my dad two effing laps to go. I'm going to be an Olympian. Like, let's go. Like, right. Um, I was very, very excited and, you know, living on cloud nine and, you know, I ended up getting a little bit of an injury right before Rio. So I did a lot of cross training in the pool, but I really can do decently with cross training. Um, I can come out being pretty like maintaining. Cause I know how to train through little injuries, just years of experience. Um, so we did that and, you know, that was a little frustrating. Like I remember feeling overwhelmed. Like I can't believe I'm injured before the Olympics, like how awful. And then I started talking to a lot of other track and field athletes and a lot of people were injured going into the Olympics. And I was like, oh, this is, this is normal. Like it's, this isn't, a, this isn't as bad as I think it is like, okay. Okay. Like this, I can do this. Right. Um, so get to the Olympics, got to walk in off and opening ceremonies. That was really cool. Maria and I raced to every freaking camera we could to wave, to try and say hi to everybody. Um, <laughs> we were really just living on cloud nine. And honestly, I was very fortunate that Maria was there, right? Maria lived this experience through London and she was my roommate and she was kind of there to guide me and be like, listen, this first week we can do more. The second week we should not, we should back off. Like, um, you know, and like, she was kind of like a good guide of how to like approach like such an overwhelming scene. Um, and so, you know, we had great races that day. I think we we're both very happy with our performances. Um, we raced well in the heat and decent times. And we, you know, at the end of the day, like to me, it was like, yeah, I made the Olympics when I finished through crossing Olympic trials, I was going to compete in the Olympics. But once you finish that race in the Olympics, you're officially an Olympian. Like you got on the start line and you finished, you know, check mark. Like you can officially say you did it. That's awesome. So you came back from the Olympics and, and that's a big transition period for a lot of people, especially the first Olympics, right? Because you've 
thought from, I don't know when you first thought about becoming an Olympian, but, you know, probably at Parkside, right? Seeing everybody at the Olympic trials. And then it's this decade long journey to, to get to the Olympic games. Um, how, what were your emotions coming home and then gearing back up to do it all over again? I was okay when I first came home, like the first few weeks. And then I started having my own issues. I had a lot of just natural life transitions going on, um, relationship wise, my living situation, things like that. A lot of things started changing in my life. And that kind of got coupled with like an Olympic depression. And I kind of had a very, uh, well, I mean, I got depressed. Like there's no doubt about it. Like I had to go to therapy. I, I got depressed and I don't try to hide that from anybody. Um, but it wasn't necessarily just because an Olympian, you know, I was having just post Olympic depression. I had just had a lot of things happening in my life that I was not prepared for. Um, and so, you know, you see my 2017 results, they're doing okay. And then 2018, I have an okay couple like performances. Um, good for me at least. And, um, then 2018, I got mono and that's when like things got really turbulent in my career. I had to come back from mono 2019. I could not hit the standard to go to Doha, which sucked. And I knew like a lot of reasons why I wasn't hitting the standard. I was working a lot. I was still building off back, coming back from mono. I was, you know, just like probably spreading myself too thin and I was getting sick a lot. Um, cause often, right. When you have like a big virus like that, your cell count is down and your just immunity is down. So you're more just susceptible to getting sick all the time with like random colds. You get like strep throat, bronchitis, things you never would have gotten before because you're just not you're not strong enough. You're not healthy enough. So I had to spend a lot of time in 2019 to get healthy. Um, and by the time the end of 2019 happened, I went to Pan Am games. And again, the second DQ of my career happened. I was like, man, we were on a here. Like every uh, few years I get DQ'd. Um, but I remember leaving Pan Am games in 2019, kind of being like, after all you've been through, like after like, you know, going through such dark phases, like you can't let it end like this. Like you have to try for Tokyo. And so I decided, right. Like I was going to try for Tokyo. I thought I stood a shot. Um, fast forward, the pandemic hits again, more life changes happening during the pandemic. Right. I have to work more. Um, I have to change coaches. A um, lot of other, just like relationship things happening in my life that are hard and difficult. And I did terrible in 2021, absolutely terrible. And it's not because my coaching was bad. It was just, I was not ready to go. Like mentally, I was not there. Um, and I had, I'd say again, another really big valley. Like I had to say after 2021 Olympic trials, like, is this how you want it to end? Like, is this your sign you need to retire and move on? Or is this your sign you can pick something, you can do it and it may not be you PRing or sending an American record, but it could just be you, you know, coming back from, you know, showing the true competitiveness that you have and coming back and showing your own strength to yourself. Um, and so I ran a lot after the 2021 Olympic trials, I was like running quite a bit for a good month. And then my coach, uh, Terrence, was like, are you ready to start walking? And I was like, yeah, but there's like this new event. Like I never really thought about doing it, but maybe I should. I was like, it's the 35 K and he, oh, he's like, you can walk a 35. He's like, you've been putting in enough running mileage. And so it was like October, like October. And we were racing in January. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. Do you think I can get enough long walks? He's like, well, let's just try. So I literally spent like a half months training for the 35. I did not spend a lot of time training for the 35 that year. And I went in with it with no expectations. Cause I've never done the event, but no clue how to race it. And I somehow won and set an American record that day. And I was like, I came through the line crying. Like I finished and immediately started bawling. Cause when you've had such a tumultuous period of time in your life for years, and then you do something like that. And it's like, I knew my time wasn't anything like super amazing. Like I didn't go out and do something like that was untouchable. It was just like, wow, I didn't expect that. I've been in such a different mindset. I didn't realize that this is what, a good, how good it could feel again. And so you just got overwhelmed by the events and I just was like crying. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and, you know, shortly after that, I, I believe you qualified for the first galactic international race walking championships. 
Yeah, that was that was pretty quickly after, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the question is, did uh, social media um, were all the Star Wars fans freaking out on you for beating up Chewbacca? No, it's funny. Uh, so I wore the the double buns at Worlds this last year, and there were like two comments I knew I was going to get, and one of them for sure was going to be like my brother making fun of me saying I look like Leia, and I was like, yeah, there it was. As soon as I finished, he's like, oh, I try to look like Princess Leia today. Like, I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think like people that got to see that really enjoyed just a lot of, you know, race walking puns with Star Wars. So, so good segue. Speaking of race walking puns, I was trying to come up with a good question for the chat GDP uh, um, of uh, related to Star Wars and you. And I put things in and I'm like, is Miranda Melville a Jedi Knight? No, Miranda Melville is an elite race walker. Jedi Knights are fictional characters. It's highly unlikely that Miranda Melville is a is a Jedi Knight. So I said, well, if Miranda Melville was a uh, a fictional Jedi Knight, what would her name be? Oh, well, Miranda Melville, the Jedi Knight of Endurance. I like that one. Um, Jedi Knight Miranda the Swift. Jedi Master Miranda the Perseverant. Jedi Sentinel Miranda, the Unstoppable, and Jedi Guardian Miranda, the Determined. All, all those adjectives definitely describe everything you just described in your story. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and so the, maybe these, these AI bots know a thing or two, right? Well, it's a little scary, man, if these AI bots know all this. <laughs> I know, I know. So, um, so obviously you just, well, not obviously, some people don't know. You just uh, won back-to-back -back 35K national titles. Mm -hmm. um the target is to qualify for the olympics in paris yeah big 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 commitment to say out loud <laughs> yeah yeah that's why i said it i'll say it for you so um so we wish you a lot of luck i'm going to open the floor to questions and see what other people want to ask you um victoria since i think you're the youngest here unless someone's lurking behind a, a still screen do you want to ask a question to miranda um what is your like cool down like after a long race? After the 35, I'm gonna be really honest, my cool down is walking to get my clothes and that is it. <laughs> like that is that is after a 35, it was it. Um after a 20k or a shorter race, like if I do a 3k race or something like that, I usually go and cool down for at least 10 minutes. Like I whether I jog or I race walk, I usually cool down for at least 10 to 12 minutes. Um, and it, it can be very slow. It does not have to be like how you felt during your warm up, right? Because you just raced, you're tired. So just go, even if you're just walking very slowly, giving yourself 10 minutes, it really helps your muscles relax after doing something so intense. And especially with shorter distances like you race, you definitely want to cool down. But mm -hmm. if you've walked, you know, over 20 miles, you're done. You're tired. Yeah. All right. Anybody else out there want to ask a question? All right, Diane. Um, it's not really a question. It's it's an image that's truly just so embedded in my mind. The finish of the trials in 2016. And there's a picture of Maria with her back to the camera. And as you cross a line, you leap into the air. And you were quite pretty high in the air. It was just an amazing image of you finishing. <laughs> yeah. I wish I had it to share. It was an amazing photo. Thank you. I appreciate it. I know that's the one that ended up in the the paper that I think a lot mm -hmm. of people saw. And then I don't even know, USATF was like on it because it was like we were day zero, day zero of the trials. And it was like in the in the pan like the program like the next day and like day one or day two like USATF was like on it putting it in the program yep. like in yeah. the programs I was actually really impressed by that I was impressed by your your finish <laughs> <laughs> I was very excited I finished to jump in the air <laughs> so Miranda you're probably you're probably too young to remember but Gary I'll bet you you remember the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat ABC absolutely <laughs> Right. You would have been the thrill of victory. And when I when I was younger, before I even race walked and was trying to run, I had a shirt and on the front it was the thrill of victory. And it was much like you leaping into the air. And on the back, it was the agony agony of defeat and had footprints going up your back. Um, <laughs> it's rough. That's rough. 
<laughs> the tough world out there. All right, anybody else got a question? I could monopolize if you'd want me to. Sure. Okay, so this is a question uh, for both you, Jeff, and for Miranda. So I, I'm from Rochester, New York also. Um, and I graduated in 76, so back then we didn't have race walking. Um, I do remember our track coach teaching us a little bit about it, but it wasn't contested back then. When did they start contesting that in New York? Oof. I would probably guess early 80s because I was a, I graduated in 85, and that was when they were getting rid of it. Hmm. For the so, Tim, well, t did Tim do it while he was in high school? Because he's from Long Island, right? So Tim would have been in the 80s, late 80s? Late, Tim was like 89. So I think... Yeah. Um, what happened was Suffolk County kept it for quite a while, but it was non-scoring. Okay. So it was and like an, so yeah. Okay. My, my year in 85 was the last year it was scoring for winter and they took it out my spring. So I didn't, I didn't get the, the joy of full competition in the spring. They still had events, but yeah. You know, and much, much like you, Miranda, I wanted to pick up the pole vault just to clear opening height for a dual meet. And my high school track coach, who was that rare coach that actually cared about the athlete, not the team, said, put it down. He's like, you're the only one on the team that's going to compete post high school, and I don't want you to kill yourself. That's funny. So um, anybody else silently behind uh, black screens or pictures want to ask a question? All right. Well, I've got, I've got more, Jeff, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so Miranda, what does your training schedule look like for the 20 and for the 35 as far as like miles per week? And what kind of sessions do you do during the week? So for the 35, um, you know, I've only done it twice now. Um, so it's very much like my coach does like a big long 30K type of walk every other week. So like, you know, one week, my long walk will be 25, 22 K, something like that. And then the next week it'll be 30 or 32 K. Um, and so, and usually the way he does our long walks is they're not just like walking one pace. You start off maybe the first five K or maybe even eight K are like pretty slower, like a certain low heart rate. And then you're every five K you're picking it up. So by the end, during like your last 10 K you're going like at race pace or just below um, so it like really helped build up and forces you to hydrate on a, on a, on a stomach that's moving at a more quick pace. And you've already, while well, you're already kind of fatigued from being on your legs for already like a couple hours, um, mileage wise, I cross train quite a bit now with my new coach. Um, we do a lot of biking. So I think Cody Rish is very similar as well. He does kind of like a very similar thing where we walk maybe like a hundred, 110 K but then we're cross training on the bike, like three to four hours every week. So it's like our mileage is kind of up there, like as it would, would be, but it's just like supplemented with heart, like getting our heart rates up on the bike. When it comes to 20 K, I don't have to sub do as much cross training. Cause I'm already kind of doing hundred K a week. So there's a little bit of cross training in there, but not as much, um, with Tim, you know, I was, younger and Tim's philosophy was a little different. We definitely put in more miles. Um, I was definitely doing like 130, sometimes 140 K a week. Um, but I think I found that my sweet spot for me to feel good is usually close to like 125, like 120. Like, I think I feel good there. I get in a lot of quality work, a lot of easy quality, easy days and things like that. And then on top of that, outside of the race, walking, cross training, I'm also lifting weights two to three times a week and doing core exercises. Okay, so what about fueling? What what, uh, what kind of fueling regimen do you use during the race? I use noon. Have you heard of noon? I don't know if you heard oh, of yeah. noon. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I use noon, I use noon endurance. Um, I would say like, and then I use goose. Like I just use goose with caffeine in them. I don't use like any ultra goo one, but I use, um, I use just like the regular goo. I take them um, about every, on an easy day because of like, depending on the paces you're going, I just kind of time it every eight to nine K, like right every like 45 minutes or so, I'm taking another goo. So. <laughs> There's oh, the yeah. picture. There's a picture. <laughs> Fun story, Molly Josephs gave me those ribbons in my hair and they were from Dr. Seuss. Um, oh, the, oh, oh, the places you'll go. <laughs> 
And, and if, if I recall, there was another picture that was even because you saw the finish line and coming across and how high you were into the air. It was pretty cool. Yeah. I was very jealous because I don't think that was a trial I went to. So I knew I was going to the Olympics and I didn't get to take the picture. So I was very sad. All right, Gary, anything else? Um, well, the, the ultimate question that everyone wants to know about shoes. So obviously there has been quite a downturn in what's available out there. Um, new fields not selling in the U.S. anymore. Um, the Rishad, the Coach Carmen's, the blue shoes are not available anymore. Um, I recently switched to the Saucony A9s, which I love right now. They're fabulous. Uh, and I know that some of the guys have been seen wearing some of the super shoes. Uh, so what are you looking at right now? What are you wearing and um, how, how are they working for you? Yeah, so I, I, as I recall, from what I remember, Maria, myself, and Katie Burnett were all wearing the super shoe at the 35. I've been wearing a super shoe. Um, I wasn't really last year, last year necessarily, but I switched over this fall. I'm also using Saucony. Um, I've been using like the Endorphin Pro mm -hmm. or the Endorphin Pro 2. They're really light. Um, I really like them. I think like they have a stiffer, a little bit of a stiffer heel, which I kind of prefer, um, where I've used the Pumas and I do like the Pumas as well, but I found that, and I think Selena Lepe has also tried them or Selena Corvera now has also tried them. And she kind of, she and I have very similar tastes in shoes that it's just a little softer of a heel. So it's just a little more wobbly. So like the stabilization of when you hit your heel down is a little more tricky to master on those shoes for us. And it might just be the way our style and technique is like, so I don't want to say don't try them, but um, just personal preference. I've liked the Saucony a lot. Um, I think Katie and all the guys really like the Asics. They're very happy with the Asics magic speed. Um, Maria has stuck with the Pumas. She really likes the Pumas. So I think like the three of us, we all kind of picked something different, but it's, it's definitely like the super shoe is nice. It's not that I feel like I'm going faster in the super shoe. It's that I feel like I, my legs recover better because there's not as much like jarring when I hit the ground. Um, so like, like just even the slightest difference, I used to feel like walking on pavement versus walking on cement. Like if I walked a like 25 K day on cement, my legs really kind of like felt, felt it versus yeah. now I can walk on cement for 30 K and I'm fine. Like and I think so it's, if you can find one that you're comfortable with, um, definitely try it. I really like Saucony's. Um, if you want, um, I can grab your email and I can send you the link to the ones I'm using. Um, but yeah, I, I prefer them and I can send you the link to the Pumas I've tried to that I thought were nice. Okay. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. No problem. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. We're going to wrap up, uh, Dora, thanks for those, uh, pictures. They were very timely. To, to flash in in between. Uh, Miranda, thank you for your time. Um, you're always awesome. And, you know, I know you commented about your technique. Um, I will just say that, you know, I made you the cover model and the, the, the model of every video we did because I think your technique is awesome. And something that was said to me a long time ago that's true today is it's a lottery and sometimes your numbers just call and it may have nothing to do with what you've done. Um, it is an unfortunate part of our sport. Yeah. And that's okay. I don't mind having to work on my technique. I think it's good to work on it. It's good to be reminders that too, that you're, you're human and you don't look like a robot all the time. You got to work on things. Um, you know, it sucks to get DQ'd or to have to be put in the pit lane and things like that. But if anything, it's just like a reminder, like, Hey, maybe you've changed something and you don't realize you've changed it and you need to go back and look at video and start like kind of working on certain things again. So yeah. Technique's always like a funny thing. I, it's definitely not, a, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that it's a judging issue. I just believe that it's a, Hey, what are you doing? That maybe that's creating like a look that the judges think sure. isn't legal. Well, that's a very mature, uh, answer. So, all right, well, we'll look forward to, uh, doing a post-Olympic interview at some point. Oh man. Knock on wood, man. <laughs> I, got, I got, I got wood here. <laughs> Knock on right. wood. On that Don't note, you. take care, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Have Thank a good you. weekend. Thank you.